Well, good morning, good afternoon, good day to any of you who are, and all of you who are joining us today. Uh, we're glad to see you here, glad for you to be with us. Uh, thanks again to Mentor National and the Ali Center for uh, making this happen, uh, to all the, the teams who have helped uh, get it up and going. So I have the privilege now of doing some pretty fun introductions for our 11 o'clock session. And uh, the first person I'm going to introduce is Dr. Saria, Sarah Hillier. Uh, I have had the privilege of knowing Dr. Hillier for a few years now, um, and it's been great. Uh, and, and I want to just point out a few of the highlights from what she's been doing before I, I turn it over to her. But uh, uh, she has been a, an educator and a consultant for, and with more than 30 years of experience. And she's worked with uh, organizations such as the U.S. Department of State, the USOPC, Islamic Federation of Women's Sports, NHL, NBA, and on and on it goes. Um, in uh, 2012, she launched the University of Tennessee's Center for Sport, Peace, and Society, which is housed in their College of, Educa of Education, Health, and Human Services. It was recognized by then Secretary of State Clinton as the sole cooperative partner of the State Department to create a global initiative designed to empower women, girls, and persons with disabilities through sport. Uh, since 2012, Dr. Hillier and her team has worked alongside of more than a thousand men, women, and youth from over 80 countries around the world, uh, which is, and she has impacted tens of thousands of lives. So that is just, just and that is because all I, that's all I have time for. I mean, there would be a whole lot more that I would like to add. Uh, but we'll start with that. And then, uh, if, if I may, before Dr. Hilly gets started, we have a couple of surprise special guests. I don't know what to call them here that are online with us this morning. And uh, they will be joining us, uh, listening in, and then adding you know, their, their thoughts and questions later on when they have them. So I would like to introduce to everyone uh, Dr. Robert Stedward. Uh, and Dr. Stedward is the founding president of the International Paralympic Committee. And I would also like to introduce Dr. David Legg from Mount Roy University. Uh, and he is with the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activities. He's also been heavily involved with the Canadian Paralympic Committee. And what is wonderful about having them here because of, you know, I know that Dr. Hillier is gonna be bringing in some uh, information about disability, but is also that since today is our, our theme is mentoring, we got this mentoring mentee pair of Dr. Stedward. I'll let you guess which one's which. Of Dr. Stedward and Dr. Lay. So they are also exemplary uh, individuals when it comes to mentoring. Uh, so that's that's all I've got. What we've got is uh, Dr. Hillier. Uh, you'll be on and talk for however, however long. Usually we've been leaving about 15 minutes at the end for presentations. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Holmes uh, and Dr. Stedward, you and Dr. Legg for being here. Honestly, when Eli said you all were joining my session, I thought this is great. I'll have an entire 45 minutes for them to mentor me. It'll be a live session. Everyone else can learn from it. Uh, so thank you all for being here. And Mary and Eli, thank you for all you do and, and the Muhammad Ali Center and Mentoring International. It is, it is an honor to be with each of you. I am flying solo today. I don't have anyone else on our small team joining us. They are super busy uh, getting ready for a big launch, uh, and I can't wait to share this with you all later. But as many of you know, this is the month of the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we're going to be rolling out some really fun, awesome, hopefully helpful resources for all the people that want to advocate on behalf of people with disabilities. So uh, I'm flying solo, which means for me, the next 30 minutes are going to be painful because it will be way too much talking just from one voice. Um, but I'm going to try to shed some light on what the center is doing uh, and the ways that we are envisioning and using the power of partnerships, mentorships, and sport for social change. So I'll jump right in uh, and get us through and, and hope 
do a good Q&A that's meaningful for all of us. So at the Center for Sport, Peace and Society, uh, we believe that everyone who's joined today has done so because we want to make a positive difference in the world. We want to use our passion. Oh, I'm going to see if I can get this slide to change our passion and platform for a purpose that is greater than ourselves. So let me say that again, because I think it's why you're here. It is definitely why I am here. I think it's why all of us are here, no matter how long we've been in this sport and social change field, we all want to learn more ways to use our passion and platform for a purpose that is greater than ourselves. So I think each of us desire something more than championship banners or rings or scholarships or medals, and all of those are worthy pursuits. But I think we've realized there is so much more that we can do through the power of sport. So I like to think in terms of we, in order for us to become the social change uh, justice fighter or champion advocate uh, or sporty peacemaker that we want to be, that we're always in this state of wanting to be better equipped or better educated. Uh, to feel more empowered to take action. And when I think in terms of action, I think in terms of taking the right action or informed action, respectful action, the type of action that lifts up the most vulnerable in our communities and honors the people most affected by injustice, discrimination, or exclusion. So, Action for us, and I think many of you, because you've been working in this space for a really long time, is also about access. And I think over my years in this work and, and wanting to do better work, I've struggled to find access to resources that help us specifically as athletes or educators or parents of athletes those who are living in the athletic realm, access to good resources. That it's not just about what we should be doing or why we should be doing it, it's the how. How can we use sport effectively in honorable ways, in ways that, that lift up the voices of others? So at the center, we believe that, that every person who wants to use sport as a tool for social change should have access to the tools, resources, and networks to be able to do that. And to be honest, it's why the center was started. And I'll share a little bit about that. I also want to say that we understand, and through my life, I definitely understand what it feels like. Mary and Eli know this very much about me, to want more from sport than championships, trophies, scholarships, and medals. And like I said, it's why the center was founded. And it's also why we're so grateful for our partnerships with the U.S. Department of State, ESPNW, nonprofit organizations and corporations, all working together for social change. Uh, specifically, I would say, towards creating a more peaceful, equitable, and inclusive world with, as Mary mentioned, a keen focus on empowering women and girls through sports uh, and the inclusion of people with disabilities. So today I thought it might be good to deconstruct or autopsy the work of the center and focus on three primary aspects of our work. So number one, partnerships. Uh, we always say at the center, we believe social change is a team sport. It's not an individual sport. So partnerships, we believe social change is a team sport. Number two is mentorship. We also believe that effective me mentoring, and this was raised actually in both um, sessions this morning, that effective mentoring also requires a team approach, that there's not one mentor that can serve all of our needs. 
Number three is storytelling. And what we believe about storytelling is that in the absence of stories about the positive ways sport can contribute to society, um, in that vacuum, it's going to be filled up with less important stories, uh, maybe more trivial story, stories around sport, or uh, worse yet, narratives that, that promote the, the, the status quo. So in the spirit of um, the third pillar, which is storytelling, rather than telling you, which would be really boring and, and, and antithetical to what we do, rather than telling you how we use storytelling, I'm gonna use storytelling the rest of the time to deconstruct what we do, how we do it, what we're learning, uh, and I'm gonna start that story in 1993. And I'm not gonna stay in the 90s for long, although actually a lot of my friends uh, accuse me of having never left in the 90s. Um, but going to the 90s is important to the history of the center as well as to our work uh, with the Global Sports Mentoring Program. So I'm gonna try to get us from the 90s to 2012 as quickly as possible. So I played basketball as a scholarship athlete at Virginia Tech. I was a shooting guard, way too slow to be a point guard, way too short to do anything other than just cause trouble inside. Um, and if I'm really honest, the three-point line became my best friend because it was the shortest distance on the court that I had to run from three-point line to three-point line, and you just launch it. So in 1993, I graduated with a degree in sports administration. But I say more importantly, I graduated with a really unhealthy relationship to food and nutrition. Um, I was never formally diagnosed as having an eating disorder, but the reality and the practicality of that in my life very much was an eating disorder. And the reason this happened is because I happened to have a coach who cared more about the psychological control of her athletes than, uh, than let's say the NCAA mission statement, which is to empower and develop the holistic well-being of student athletes. That was not my experience. So I'll spare you all the details of that and get straight to the point. When I received my diploma, I walked across the stage, got my diploma, and instead of going and sitting back down with my classmates, I walked straight up the stadium stairs, got in my parents' car, and we drove eight hours home to Kentucky. And on the way home, I told my parents, I will never have anything to do with sports again the rest of my life. So I spent the next year trying to figure out what was next. I had a degree in sports administration, so I was struggling to find a meaningful career um, while staying true to my purpose, that I will never have anything to do with sports again the rest of my life. So one morning during that year, I had an epiphany. And that epiphany was this. Wait a minute, Sarah. Sport didn't do this to you. It's what someone in a position of power or influence did to you. And if she had the power to take away uh, your confidence or your sense of belonging or identity or your immense joy and love for sport, Sarah, you also have power. You have the ability to use sport to empower people, to give them confidence um, and a holistic sense of strength, to give them a joy and love of sport that goes beyond um, something, that goes beyond the, the championships and all of that, but this serves a bigger purpose. And I also had the ability to help give people a deep, authentic sense of belonging and identity that goes beyond the, the jersey number that we wear. So I didn't realize it in the moment, but after years of reflecting, this was the moment for me that a passion for mentoring athletes was born. 
because I think what I missed all those years and during that time trying to navigate it is I didn't have a mentor. I was looking to a coach as a mentor and that mentor um, caused a lot of destruction. And I was absent of a mentor to help guide me through that time. And so I think this, this time for me uh, was the birth of understanding and really valuing the power of mentorship. So a few months after uh, I had this grand epiphany, I started a nonprofit organization called Sport for Peace. And for the next 15 years, I partnered with US organizations, international organizations, using sport to promote gender equity, the inclusion of people with disabilities, uh, refugee resettlement, um, some things that were just near and dear to my heart. So as most of you will remember, um, during these years, sport for development and peace was not yet recognized by the UN. It was still a very ad hoc movement. Um, and there wasn't a lot of funding for sport-based projects, especially um, international and doing this kind of work. So for 15 years, I baked a lot of brownies, I washed a lot of cars, and I took on a lot of part-time random jobs, um, anything that would give me the flexibility to be able to travel uh, when called upon, when an opportunity came up. And the opportunities were coming at a much, much quicker pace than what I could fund with my lemonade stands. Um, China, Brazil, Mexico, uh, Turkey, Tunisia, Morocco, Jordan, Zimbabwe, South Africa. So this, this little group in Kentucky with lemonade stands and car washes and bake sales, uh, doors were opening for us in countries that I never imagined going and working alongside women um, and female student athletes who were going with me that I was having the opportunity to mentor through their experiences. So the need for financial resources to sustain the work, let alone scale the work, was a huge missing piece of our puzzle. And this is what led me back to school um, at 35, which was still young, but at the time it felt old to go back to school. I was so out of it, um, so out of the rhythm of school. But it's what led me here to the University of Tennessee to study my PhD in sports sociology. I had two goals for coming back to school. It was not to become an academic, I can promise you that. I had two goals. I was fixated on learning how to write grant proposals so that I could know how to better apply for larger scale funding than the brownies I was selling. And number two, I wanted to learn how to do research because in, let's take uh, our work in Iran, for example. So for 10 years, I had the opportunity uh, want to spend one month every year over a 10 year period in Iran, helping to develop their women's sports system. And of all things, they asked me to introduce fast pitch women's softball, which had never been played in the history of the Persian empire. Um, and we, we, we started from scratch and now they have 13 teams around the country, Mary, that are still playing. They are still going, yes. Um, one of those beautiful ways where you work yourself out of a job, I was perfect. But in Iran all of these years, I was seeing so much personal transformation, community transformation, uh, small policy changes, um, but I didn't have any way to come home and, and report that with any rigor. You know, it was just anecdotal, you know, evidence. So my second reason for going back to school was to learn how to do rigorous research so that I could make a case for the transformation I was seeing. I had every intention after accomplishing those two goals of going back to sport for peace full time. But I had a second epiphany moment. Uh, those of you who teach research seminar, I apologize for this next statement, but I was sitting in a riveting research seminar, you know, holding my head up, trying to make it through. But I had this epiphany sitting in that research seminar 
and it was, and I'm sorry that I'm not going in my slides. I'm horrible with this, uh, with, but this is the second epiphany. I thought to myself, what if, what if there was a program that actually taught students about sport and social change or equipped and educated the next generation of people that want to use sport for something good? Or what if there was formal mentorship for student athletes who want to do more and contribute more to society than just helping their university win a national championship? And so I just started asking myself all of these what if questions. And the final question I asked myself is, was beyond what if, it was a why question. And the question was, wait a minute, why isn't sport and social change a part of every sport-based educational curriculum? Why, why is this um, missing? It, and so that was the idea for me to, wow, this is a huge gap. So I, I started doing some research. I found that there were a few university-based initiatives in the U.S. at the time that were using sport for social change, and most of those were in a local context. Um, but I couldn't find any that were addressing specifically issues of gender equity, inclusion of people with disabilities, refugee resettlement, and a global focus. And I know those are very niche, but those were areas that I was very passionate about. So two days later, I wrote a proposal to create an educational and service center at the University of Tennessee and thought, well, I'm not gonna go back to Sport for Peace. I'm gonna bring Sport for Peace into higher education and I'm gonna try to make change within the institution with, to try to help support the, the mentoring of any student who's studying any sport-related discipline um, to be equipped and empowered to do this work. Okay, we're here. We are at 2012. And I'm sorry we did spend more time in the 90s, but this history is really important. So in 2012, two really important things happened. One is the University of Tennessee officially recognized uh, the Center for Sport, Peace, and Society. So that proposal in the research seminar came to life. We started with absolutely no money, but a belief and a vision, and that was enough for me. That was enough for me to have the infrastructure um, to pursue that dream. The second thing that happened in 2012 is we were awarded the first ever cooperative agreement partnership with the U.S. Department of State um, to implement the global sports mentoring program. And so let me shift now into what is the global sports mentoring program and you'll see how all this starts to come together. I'm gonna to refer to it as the GSMP because it's such a long name. So the GSMP is essentially an international leadership development program and it now primarily consists of two pillars. One is empowering women and girls through sports, gender equity. The other is sport for community, the inclusion of people with disabilities. So simply stated, if I were to wrap up what the GSMP is, it's a five week intensive, immersive mentorship experience designed to empower approximately 40 international delegates, we call them delegates instead of mentees, just to eliminate some of that power differential, um, between the ages of 25 and 40. And so I, I know a lot of our talk over yesterday and today has been focused on youth mentoring, and this is very much mentoring intended to reach young professionals within countries who are trying to use their passion and platform and sport for a purpose that is greater than themselves. So um, I'll say that I'd like, maybe we should start with the first aspect of our work. So if, um, if you remember that I said partnerships uh, that we believe social change is a team sport, and we very much believe that. 
And we're so grateful to have a lot of teammates who are joining the efforts to uh, bring the Global Sports Mentoring Program to life. And so um, let's deconstruct some of the partnerships. And I'm going to start with um, the first uh, aspect of the partnership, which is the U.S. Department of State. So the U.S. Department of State, uh, specifically their sports diplomacy division, and um, I didn't know this until we started partnering with them, but the sports diplomacy division was launched in 2001, shortly after 9-11, as one of our country's diplomatic strategies to engage youth around the world to prevent them from becoming radicalized. And so this is one of our nation's responses uh, to terrorism is to use sport as a tool for diplomacy. And so this was the birth of our sports diplomacy division. So in the GSMP, the State Department serves as the lead partner and the funding agency. So Mary, Eli, any of you that are Americans, um, I'm gonna make you feel better right now about April 15th because this is what I tell myself every April 15th when I pay my taxes, that my tax dollars are going to support the GSMP, which is making a difference through the power of sport around the world for women and people with disabilities. So the US government, our taxpayer dollars, fund this initiative at about $1 million per year to use the power of sport and mentoring to create social change. The second role that the State Department plays is they work closely with the U.S. embassies in dozens of countries that they identify as diplomatic priorities. And the U.S. embassies are responsible for recruiting and identifying the international delegates who will become the mentees of this five-week immersive program. And so that's partner number one. Partner number two are the mentor organizations or the host organizations. And that would be some of the people that you see, some of the organizations that you see on the screen. Um, I'm sure many of you, like us, are celebrating uh, this month the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so I thought it would be most appropriate um, to use our Sport for Community program, uh, the one that's focused on the rights of people with disabilities moving forward is our case study, if you will. So if we took that, um, our mentor organizations in the case of Sport for Community include rehabilitation hospitals, uh, university and community adaptive sports programs, um, uh, the U.S. Tennis Association. Historically, the USOPC has participated, but not in a few years. We need to get them back on the team, back on the bus. And each mentor organization hosts one or two international delegates for a three-week mentorship experience. During that time, they are introducing their delegate to every aspect of their business. And number two, uh, which is really the outcome, is they're working with their delegate to create a sport-based action plan or a business plan um, of how to use sport for social change in their local communities. And then the, the third partner in the formula is our small team at the University of Tennessee. Um, and as the cooperative agreement grant recipient, our responsibility is, is the vision and the execution, the implementation evaluation um, of that. And so it includes everything from logistics and communications, um, but more importantly, it's the design and the delivery of a curriculum that we've built around mentoring for social change called uh, the Better World Curriculum, and I, we won't get into all that. Um, and then we are committed to long-term monitoring and evaluation and long-term support of all of our alumni. So these are the three entities that make up the GSMP team or the partnerships. Um, and I think for us, um, that's been the beauty of it, is that we've done it in collaboration and have built a tremendous network 
of partners all laser focused on using sport and the power of mentorship to, in this case, promote more inclusion for people with disabilities. Okay, so let's shift uh, to mentorship. And if you remember, uh, we said mentorship also requires, effective mentorship also requires a team approach. And so we very much take a team approach when it comes to mentoring. Uh, I'll give two examples just for the sake of time. Mentoring on the GSMP, uh, our small team at the University of Tennessee becomes one set of tribe of mentors for the international delegates. And that happens at three phases. We actually start the mentoring before they even arrive in the US for their full five week program. Um, and that begins happening during the interview stage, the matching uh, stage, matching them with their mentors um, and all of the pre-program preparation. And then during the program, when the international delegates, all 20 of them, it's the happiest day of my life to pick all of them up from the airport. And we spend one week together in Washington, DC, building a family. We build um, a culture of responsibility for one another and accountability to one another in ways that, um, that give us that sense of belonging and identity. We are creating an identity of a family of change makers, of sporty change makers. Um, so during the program, our team is very active during that first week, then we send them off to their mentors, uh, to their neck, we say to their grandparents, we're the parents, <laughs> send them off to the grandparents uh, to mentor them and love them and to help them really shape their action plans. And then we all come back together for a family reunion during the fifth week of the program where the delegates present their action plans in a TED Talk style we celebrate one another's journeys, do quite a bit of debrief, uh, post, you know, program evaluation, and then we send them home to support them for the long term. And so that's one aspect of bringing a tribe of mentors. So the team at the University of Tennessee were four to six people strong, um, and, and we become a tribe of mentors. And then the second, which is really the, the heartbeat or the, what it's defined around are the mentor organizations. And so let's take, um, let's take the US Tennis Association for an example. USTA, um, they don't just have one mentor there to meet the needs of the, of the delegate or to, to do that. You can imagine a three week, eight, 10 hours a day, 24 hours a day, it's not possible for one person to meet all those needs and to carry on their, their daily duties. And so what we've built is a, a best practices guide. We say best practices guide, uh, mentoring the GSMP way. It's very specific to this initiative, but certainly could be shared across other initiatives as well. Um, and I'm happy to share that. And so, um, with that, the tribe of mentors, let me give an example of um, the ways that we break it down. So the USTA example would identify a lead mentor. So think in terms of a, a head coach for a basketball team, X's and O's, high level strategy. Um, then there's an assistant to the lead mentor and think in terms of an assistant coach, someone who is a little more um, accessible, someone who bridges that gap a little bit between the, the high level of, of the head coach. Then we have a small team of what we call cultural social mentors. So think of that as a, a support staff that if a new athlete arrived on campus and was a freshman, that support staff would be responsible for, um, you know, all the logistics and uh, making sure that that student athlete knows the, the culture of the campus and the history and of the city and where things are, um, as well as setting up 
uh, social events and meals and service projects. And so that would be the, the small team of social cultural. Mary, if you have to cut me off at any point, please do. Um, so, and then the last is... Um, yeah, Sarah, uh, yeah uh, Sarah, if you could, because we do want to get to some of the questions. Absolutely. We can wrap so we can get to people. Thank you. Yeah, of course, of course. And then the, the last one um, is a logistical mentor. So think in terms of a director of operations. Okay, so I'll get, I'll skip through some of this because maybe it'll come up in the questions. But I guess the, this is the approach and what the impact has been is so far 192 women and men have gone through the program from 83 countries. And as we think about partnerships and the importance of that, um, I just want to say that 1,463 new global partnerships have been developed exactly from the action plans. Um, there's statistics on social media, and we'll make sure that you all have this uh, presentation as well for some of the impact uh, and the outcomes of this five-week investment with the, the mentorship model that we've used. So Mary, I'll stop there. I appreciate your uh, mentoring in me for time. If you had a rope when we're in person, I knew you usually lasso me and pull me off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that would be fair if you did. So um, thank you all. I hope it gives you a little insight into the ways that the State Department and UT and other organizations are working together and see mentoring as a team sport and social change as a team sport. All right. Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mary. Uh, you're welcome. Um, as we move into our Q&A session, I'd like to actually start with our guests. Um, and so Dr. Stedward, if you would like to weigh in and then we'll go to, to uh, Dr. Lake. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mary. And may I first of all say uh, what uh, it is a, a privilege for me to be amongst uh, all you uh, scholars. I've been retired for quite some time now. And when you get away from the books and the research and the people it makes it very difficult to keep up but i but i have kept up as much as i can over the years and and dr leg has always pushed me to keep up anyway so that's always good you talk about uh, mentorships uh, sarah that's uh, that's where it can very easily be but i just wanted to make if i if i may and i'll make it very brief um when we talk about the International Paralympic Committee as an organization and the Paralympic movement as a sporting movement, it's interesting how we started, uh, and I remember bringing forward the first concerns that sport for athletes living with a disability was stuck in a rut. Uh, we were very much a disability organization, not a sport organization. Uh, there were a lot of uh, a lot of discrimination, uh, which I may say so. So, uh, when I brought forward a meeting in 1987 to look at the future of sport for athletes with a disability, we started looking at what are the important aspects for our athletes. And we looked at um, passing, I think, 23 resolutions at that meeting over a four-day period. And one, two or three of the most important things was, yes, we need an organization. Two, it needs to be sport-based, not disability-based. Three, it needs to include athletes as, as well as nations uh, in the decision-making process. Uh, Etc. So, uh, and and inclusion was a very important part of our moving forward as well. And accessible and access to other uh, non-disabled organizations, if I can use that term. So that's where we started back in '87 to then formally creating the International Paralympic Committee in 1989. My 
I guess my concern, and we grew very, very quickly, and, and it was very difficult going from when I was a founding president in 89 with 42 nations, and uh, now they're um, 200 nations. So it has grown. We were really a, a, just a, a small cog in the wheel of international sport. And, and but we fought for our rights and our recognition. We were doing that so much that we forgot a lot about partnership and mentorship and, and social issues uh, with regards to people with disability because they were they were facing more of that with difficulties than the non-disabled population. So I'm really glad to see that the Paralympic movement now is, uh, is including more athletes in, in the mentorship and decision-making process. But I still have a concern that now, and perhaps in the very near future, there's very, very little research that's being uh, challenged and completed in order to help lift the organization more, particularly uh, uh, in the area of uh, social change. Uh, and I think that needs to be done in the future. Yes, we have to take care of the day-to-day -day operations, but we still have to encourage more academics at universities around the world to get more involved with the uh, aspect of social change through research. And, and I know that that's what I tried to start off in 1993 when uh, Sarah was starting off her career, when we hosted our first VISTA conference to include athletes, coaches, administrators, and medical. So I'll leave it at that, but what a true privilege it is for me to be immersed amongst such uh, great people and, uh, and it keeps us old guys young. Uh, thank you for everything. You have no idea, but we've been following in your footsteps and working to, um, to continue to amplify your legacy. And so you don't know this, but you have been a hero for me for a long time. Well, I, I appreciate it very much, Sarah. It means so, a lot. David? Um, Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Eli, um, for the invitation uh, to attend today. Sarah, it's a real pleasure to meet you. I very much enjoyed your presentation. Um, I did not wear the burnt orange uh, on purpose. Uh, that was not a, a purposeful decision. <laughs> Although I did appreciate the, uh, the metaphor that you used about the lasso. It's actually, this week is typically the Calgary Stampede, uh, which some of you may have heard of uh, in the US. Anyways. My story is very similar to yours, Sarah, in many respects, in timing and process. And as it relates to mentorship um, with Dr. Sedward. So in the early 90s, I was uh, living and working in Ottawa, uh, which is Canada's national capital in Ontario. I was working at Canadian Wheelchair Sport and decided to go back to school to pursue my PhD at the University of Alberta, which is in Western Canada in Edmonton. Um, with Dr. Sedward as my advisor. And so he became my mentor at that time. And very similar uh, to the GSMP, he managed what was then called the Rick Hansen Center. Um, Rick Hansen is a, a famous wheelchair uh, track athlete and disability advocate in Canada. It's now referred to as the Sedward Center, um, named after Dr. Sedward. But at the time, it was very similar, Sarah, to your concept with the GSMP. That was a um, an international collection of graduate students and researchers at a fitness center, all under the tutelage um, of Dr. Stedward. And you know, he he mentioned that you know he wished, with the advent of the of the IPC in 1989, that there was perhaps more research on a on a social level. And it, you know, I think about the people that are doing research in that area, and a lot of them come from a connection through him um, and certainly other people that have been mentored uh, that I've been mentored by and Mary's one of them um, and Mary probably doesn't you know know that uh, I, I probably haven't expressed that as, as probably as, as best that I should or could but her and uh, a guy by the name of Ted Fay um, who was at the University in, um, at University of Massachusetts or I guess it was at uh, State University of New York at the time I can't remember exactly when I first met Ted and through Eli. And I've known 
and so we've done a, actually, you know, not a lot of research, but certainly some research on the social change agenda as it relates to athletes uh, with a disability. And again, those mentorship relationships go back 20 years. And I think that's part of the mentorship role that is an important piece to this is that it, it can happen in small bits, but I think too, it's also important to recognize the longevity of these relationships um, and the importance of coming in and coming out of people's lives and throughout their careers um, and how we continue to need uh, mentorship. And so I'm in my 50s now and Dr. Stetter uh, continues uh, to be a very important mentor for me, um, just as a husband, as a father, um, perhaps not so much even in the academic role anymore, but more on a, on a personal level. And so those important relationships that we have continue, um, need, need to be continued, need to be nurtured, need to be, um, uh, I guess, stoked like a, like a fire. And so I, it, like I, I very much enjoyed uh, your story and it's certainly connected with me uh, personally, Sarah. Thank you so much. Great. Well, this, this has been a wonderful session. Uh, I know that we have a few questions that are uh, in the chat. Um, and I know that we have been on pace uh, with our sort of going for five minute and off 15 minute so that we can get a break and then fire up for the next, for the next presentation. Um, Sarah, is there anything else that you would like to add after having heard uh, from uh, you know, from our guests and seen, seen maybe some of the things in the chat, just a minute or two at the end here as we wrap. Uh, no, I would just say thanks for the opportunity to share about what's happening through mentorship and partnerships and for Dr. Legg and Dr. Stedward to join. It was, it was a true honor to be here with you guys and um, hopefully we can stay in touch and help amplify the work that's happening and Mary, thank you always, always, always for your leadership. Um, so as a yeah. virtual Hugs. hug. Yeah, yeah. Hugs yeah. to you too. Um, and I will take a look at the questions and if there's any answers I can type in here or anything that we can provide, um, yeah. happy to do so. I would say next week for anybody that's interested, we're launching um, lots of free resources for people that want to advocate for people with disabilities and celebration. Um, we've created the, I'm so excited about this, the world's first ever interactive global map that when you hover over any country, um, it pops up with all of the disability rights laws that exist for that country. Then it connects that to um, what they're doing, what that country is doing in the Paralympics, Special Olympics, and Deaf Olympics. Um, and it gives a bio uh, for someone that is working on sport and social change on behalf of people or with people with disabilities. Um, so then you can see what's happening at the grassroots policy and what's happening in uh, sport. And so um, for anybody that wants to, to see that or to be able to use that resource, um, I'll drop in our social media information here um, yeah. for everybody to do that. Yes, that's what I was gonna ask you to do. If you can share that um, via the chat, then people will have it. That sounds awesome. I can't, I know what I'm gonna be doing next week. <laughs> I'm having a look at that, that's for sure. We'll and you know, I really appreciate again the work that you've done with Sport for Development and Peace, and also specifically the work you've done with women and girls and sport for people with disabilities. You know, it, I live at that intersectionality as a woman with a dis an adult onset disability. So, um, so thanks from all of those different parts of me and from the audience who's been here, but really appreciate it. Eli, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Stedward, Dr. Legg, Dr. Hillier, thank you all. Eli, back at you. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, and I will get, and also it's been an honor and you know just a wonderful session here, and having uh, Dr. Stedward and Dr. Leg join. It's kind of a surprise special guest. That was kind of a fun kind of inner way to you know, make things happen. So um, it's really nice to all come together. And so we're going to now transition into the next, and yeah, continue on the chat. Um, yeah, we're gonna get our Oscar and and uh, Dr. Cooper, uh, uh, Joey Cooper in. Um, 
So great, well, thank you. And uh, we'll, we're gonna now put the slide up for the break.